is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am an addictions physician working out of Toronto, Canada. And today I want to talk about the issue of what are medications that can be used to help you stop drinking alcohol. I'm going to talk about seven different medications. First of all, there are the craving reducers, the ones that you take to reduce cravings. Then there are the medications that you take as alternatives to alcohol. And then there's medications that you take so that you don't want to drink alcohol because it makes you feel so sick. A physician will pick what type of medication they think is most appropriate. And sometimes you can take one or two or three all at the same time. So let's get started. I'm going to start with the craving reducers. And top on the list of the craving reducers is a drug called naltrexone. The brand name for that is sometimes called Revia. Another version of naltrexone is Narcan. This is the drug that an opiate user would take if they're in overdose or well, somebody else would give it to them so to bring them back to life essentially. And that's actually the mechanism of uh, naltrexone. So naltrexone is a drug that reduces cravings by suppressing, dwarfing, diminishing, flattening the endorphin response. And an endorphin, for those of you who don't know, is the neurochemical that helps steal pain relief. So if something happens to me and I get hurt, I'll have a flood of my own endorphins. It's like my own stash of pain medication that will flood my system and make me not feel pain. Presumably until I can get away from the dangerous situation that caused the pain, I'll feel the pain later when I'm safe. So we have a natural endorphin system and that is to create pain relief. And sometimes it's emotional pain too, like numbing pain. And so a lot of times people will use opiates because opiates are the classic example of that or they've injured themselves you know a knee injury something you take a bunch of Tylenol 3s or or codeine or or Demerol or something for pain or you take it for pain relief of mental distress which is often why uh, drug users will use it with their use of fentanyl or oxycodone or oxycontin. You may not know that alcohol has an endorphin response. It has a dopamine response, a serotonin response, a GABA response and an endorphin response and it flattens the endorphin response and what that means is that when you're drinking, you have uh, the effect of, amongst other things, feeling giddy and happy and, and excited and chilled all at the same time. There's a sort of feeling of subtle joy, pleasure that happens when you have one or two drinks. I'm not talking about when you're drunk. I'm talking about those first few drinks that gives you that nice, warm buzz feeling. And when you take naltrexone, it cuts that. So how does naltrexone work as a craving reducer for alcohol? Well, if you take that drug, you're not going to get that response. You'll still get the chilled response, the slower response. You might get a little bit of the excitement, but you won't get that nice, warm, fuzzy. Why would you drink something that's going to get you into trouble? Why would you mess up your sobriety, a drink that's not going to give you that desired effect? It has a list of side effects, like for example, nausea and headache and dizziness, insomnia. Clinically, I have to say, most of the time I don't see those side effects. It's not a common thing. What I worry about though, is that it does flatten endorphin, which means then that if you're about to go in for surgery and they give you some kind of an opiate for pain relief, you won't be able to feel the effect of the pain. So I worry about potential that you won't have your own access to endorphins when you need them. You can't always plan it, like if you're having an accident or something like that, you can't plan that. And the other thing I kind of worry about is, Natural endorphins are part of our joy response. And I do worry if uh, it might flatten our, my ability to feel natural joy, especially after something traumatic has happened. Because often what happens is, is you go through the trauma, you work it through, and then you feel better after. But that's an individual thing. Some people say, no, that doesn't happen at all. And other people say it does. By the way, naltrexone is also used to uh, curb the response from food, sugar as well. So it's also used for that. Naltrexone is used for opiates and sugar and alcohol. Second on the list is Campro or a Camprosate. This is a drug that works on a different mechanism. It does affect the neurochemicals as well, just like naltrexone did on different neurotransmitters. The end result of Camperol is that it reduces cravings of, for people who have stopped drinking. It's not entirely clear to me what the mechanism of action is other than it, it um, mitigates the effect of some neurotransmitters in the brain, but it has been found to be fairly effective in reducing alcohol consumption. There are some side effects like nausea, diarrhea, stomach pain. Again, 
I haven't seen much of that clinically. It's usually fairly well tolerated and is worthwhile taking. So both the naltrexone and the Camprol are fairly well tolerated and are worth a try. The third drug that is used also as an anti-craving or reduction of craving is topiramate. And this is a drug that is actually an anti-convulsant. It would, that's what its purpose is. And so it may serve the double purpose that if a person has a risk of seizure and they're given topiramate, that it might be treating their seizure disorder and also reducing cravings. So that is a benefit. How it actually affects alcohol cravings is not clear, but it does seem to be somewhat effective. You know, there's some research that suggests that it can be quite a significant change. It seems to be individual, and I can't tell you what individual, and it's worth a try. Now, the thing about topiramate, it's third on the list because it has some side effects that can be problematic, more than the, the first two that I mentioned. And the most common ones are a drowsiness or a lethargy, or just not quite remembering connecting the dots. It's a drug that's worth trying, but be aware that you might find that you just don't like how you feel on it. Topiramate has a weight effect. It often has a weight reducing effect. It's certainly a weight neutral effect. And this is actually quite uncommon for psychiatric medications, which tend to make people gain weight, if, if anything. Topiramate actually seems to re uh, either maintain weight or slightly reduce weight. So it's sometimes used for weight loss, although that's not what we're talking about here. If that's an issue, that might be another consideration. The next drug is baclofen. And baclofen is actually a muscle relaxant. What it actually does is it enhances the GABA response in the brain. And the GABA uh, neurochemical is that neurochemical that chills and slows us down, a bit like a benzodiazepine, but it's not a benzodiazepine, so it doesn't have that same potentially um, dangerous profile. It calms you down a little bit and it can dampen cravings. It's actually also used to dampen cravings for cocaine. That's a, a, another common uh, use for it. So it's a muscle relaxant and a anti-craving medication. This drug has consequences, it has side effects. Because it's a muscle relaxant, if you take too much of it, it can cause drowsiness and dizziness and maybe some weakness or an instability. And there is potentially a tolerance or addiction potential. Now, we're moving into another category of drugs, which are alternatives, as it were, as opposed to craving reducers. And I'm going to suggest uh, this drug, gabapentin, which actually is a craving reducer too but it also acts as a alternative. Uh, gabapentin is an anticonvulsant in the same way that topiramate was, but it's much more than that, or it's used for much more than that. It's used for pain relief, it's used for like especially neuropathic pain, it's used for mood, it's used for anxiety especially, it's used to help people sleep, it's used to prevent seizures from alcohol, just like uh, uh, topiramate. We use it often to help somebody get off of alcohol, especially if we want, don't want to give them a benzodiazepine. Our side effects to gabapentin, they can cause drowsiness as well and dizziness, and they certainly have an addictive potential. They are actually drugs um, that can be sold on the street, as it were, or you take a drug and take gabapentin on top of it to potentiate that drug. So they have to be used carefully. The doses can be racked up quite high so we always recommend people start slow and then work up if you're on a high dose and you want to get off you have to taper down slowly it's probably one of the most commonly used drugs in the uh, addiction field right now it works as a craving reduction almost an al alcohol alternative it doesn't give you the buzz although there does appear to be some level of intoxication on high doses I'm saving one drug that really really does help alcohol cravings and alcohol withdrawal for a but it's also the one to be used most carefully and I think it's a very useful drug short term. In fact, I have a full other uh, little talk on benzos and benzodiazepine withdrawal. This is a medication that's used to treat anxiety and insomnia and alcohol withdrawal. So alcohol goes to the GABA receptors. That's the part that makes the person feel chill, not that euphoric feeling of the uh, of the endorphins. This is the more relaxed feeling. And when a long-term drinking develops a tolerance, then their GABA receptors are um, down-regulated to the point where if the person stops drinking, they run the risk of having a seizure. And I'm actually going to do a whole other talk on just alcohol seizure, just so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But benzodiazepines are used in the short term to prevent seizure. It's kind of like giving the person a pill form of alcohol, and it will actually reduce the withdrawal. And while the person is high, the cravings, 
but long-term use of it doesn't work because like alcohol, a patient will develop a tolerance and then therefore a, a necessity to take it, basically they'll have withdrawal and then they can have a seizure from not just the alcohol, quitting the benzodiazepines. So you have to use it very cautiously. So it's a great short-term solution, but not a long-term solution. The other thing about long-term use of benzodiazepines, which I talk about in that other uh, lecture, but I'll just say here now, is besides the fact that they're very habit-forming, they cause drowsiness, for sure, memory loss, for sure, impaired cognition, especially long-term use of them. You don't want to be on these long-term if you can avoid it. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but there are other alternatives, gabapentin, for example, and some of the uh, antidepressants as well that have an anti-anxiety component. Those are always more favored. So that ends the part about craving reducers and sort of craving alternatives, like or alcohol alternatives. Then the next drug I saved for last because it's in a sense the oldest and the best known and that's antabuse. Now antabuse is not a craving reducer, it's not a replacement for alcohol, it's a deterrent. It is a medication that if you take you will feel violently ill in such a way that you will not want to drink because who's in their right mind is going to drink something that will make them feel so nauseous so sick that they can't get out of bed that if they're that uncomfortable it's a very unpleasant physical reaction major discouragement for you to drink now how it works is it stops the breakdown of alcohol which is toxic to the brain to the end product which is just sugar and water that process requires an enzyme that metabolizes uh, the alcohol to the uh, end product. In that breakdown, there is a chemical that's called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And what happens is, is that when this process going from one to the other stops, there's a buildup of this aldehyde dehydrogenase. It should go from alcohol to aldehyde de dehydrogenase to water and the sugar and whatever else is left. But what happens is, is it gets stuck there and then there's a buildup of aldehyde dehydrogenase and that causes that flushed feeling, that nauseous feeling that antabuse creates. And incidentally, it's the same flushed and nauseous feeling that a person has with a hangover later because all of aldehyde dehydrogenase has not actually been cleared yet in a normal process of drinking. But antabuse uh, puts you in that, so it's essentially like drinking, taking antabuse, and then you're put into a, not just the hangover for the morning, but for the whole day. And I remember somebody telling me that they had a wedding to go to and they had been in recovery and they were really afraid they were going to drink. So they took antabuse in the morning so that they wouldn't drink because they didn't want to be sick while they were getting married. Like they were literally going to get married that day. They took it and they got sick because you know what happens when you're an alcoholic, you do, you use despite negative consequences. But he said, I'll never do that again because it was so unpleasant. Now, the problem with antabuse, and this is why it was actually taken off the market for a number of years it's been reintroduced but not all pharmacies will carry it. Um, it, it they're compounding pharmacies and they use it very cautiously and here in Toronto we only know of a few of them that actually do it because it causes liver damage and who are the people who are most likely going to need antabuse people with problems drinking and who are the people that have the biggest issues with livers people with problems drinking so it's almost like you're prescribing a drug for somebody that um, has liver issues and you're going to potentially give them more liver issues. So we have to be careful about the use of this drug. It, it should be used just when necessary. A lot of people in recovery who don't want to take medications like the others that I've mentioned on a regular basis might use this just on an as-needed basis. It covers all the medications that are possible for um, alcohol. Of course there are antidepressants and antipsychotics. I'll talk about those in different uh, classes. These are the ones that are specific to alcohol. So you won't be surprised if your doctor pulls out a prescription pad and suggests these. Thank you.